five important gold charts to watch right now. In such volatile times, let's see if gold is whispering anything to us for guidance. The first chart you're looking at is called the gold to S&P 500 ratio. In this chart, you'll see how the price ratio of one ounce of gold to the price level of the S&P 500 index has varied over the years based on using the monthly high closing price of gold. The higher the ratio, you can think the more expensive gold is relative to the S&P 500. The opposite is true when the ratio is below one. A return to the 50-year average ratio would mean gold would be at a price of a little over $2,176 per ounce, which would be a 14% increase over the current spot price of gold. This means gold is undervalued by 14% if you want to use this metric relative to its 50-year average of the S&P 500. In other words, gold has a long way to run before it gets to multi-generational average ratio level with the S&P 500. Even an all-time high closing price, the nominal closing price of gold at $2,063 an ounce, the golden S&P 500 ratio is still lower than the 50-year average. And if you want to take the all-time high of this ratio, it's anywhere between four and a half to 9.6 times lower than it was during periods of double-digit inflation. While the S&P 500 continues pushing its own all-time highs, it's worth noting that only 239 of its 500 components, less than half, are up year to date. More importantly, only 72 of the S&P 500 companies have outperformed gold and only 52 have outperformed the GDX, which is the Vanek Gold Miners ETF. Miners Freeport McMoran and Newmont are the 50th and 51st best performing stocks in the S&P 500 index, both up over 39% year to date. They are the only two base and precious metal mining companies in the S&P 500. The next chart is the inflation adjusted gold price. When gold hit its nominal all time high close, a little over $2,063 on August the 6th, 2020, it was actually only its 24th best closing price when adjusted for inflation. Now, when you adjust for inflation, it's important to index to the year. Now, I decided to index to 2012 because I remember what I was doing on August the 6th, 2020 in 2012. Real or inflation adjusted prices can be calculated simply by using any inflation indicator. The most well known one is the CPI, which is the consumer price index. But in this case, we'll be using the GDP price deflator, which is generally considered a more robust measure of inflation. So what you're looking at right now is if we put together the gold's top 10 highest daily closing prices after adjusting for inflation using the 2012 date for inflation setting, we can see that they were all either in January 1980 or between August and September of 2011. In 2012 dollars, spot gold would need to hit $2,349 an ounce just to match its inflation adjusted all time high set on January 21st, 1980. Now, for any of the math nerds out there, you can play around with the inflation adjusted and put it in any year you want. And if you're younger, you're going to want to put it in more terms that you understand or can relate to what a dollar could buy during that time frame. At the current gold spot price, gold would need to rise $443 or 23% just to match the previous all-time high. So you can see that gold's nowhere near its all-time highs in a real pricing. The chart you're looking at might superficially suggest that gold's current prices aren't all that impressive, but inflation measures have their limitations. So it's worth taking note anytime asset prices hit all time highs, even in nominal terms. In either case, the difference between previous inflation adjusted highs means that gold still has plenty of additional price upside. It's no secret that mining stocks provide great leverage to the underlying metal they produce. But the question is, are gold miners still a bargain in today's market? The short answer is, yes, they are. When compared to almost every other industry in the stock market, 
This is especially true when you consider that long-term outlook for gold is bullish, not bearish. So in the chart you're looking at, we look at the price to forward cash flow per share. So it's forward CFPS multiples. This tells us where stock prices are relative to cash flows they're expected to generate over the next 12 months. So you can see the NASDAQ's current price to forward cash flow per share is almost at 21 times. The mining juniors producers in the GDXJ, which is kind of a false name for it because many companies producing over 500,000 ounces of gold a year or over a $5 billion market cap are in the GDXJ, is trading at about 7.5 current price forward cash flow per share, which is the lowest of the, the industry. So gold miners and especially senior producers have benefited greatly in this bull market, no doubt about it. Yet the multiples for the JDX and the JDXJ, now remember the Vanek Gold Senior is the GDX and the Junior Gold Miners ETFs is GDXJ, but look, they're, they're not little startup companies producing uh, a few ounces here and there. These are big producers in the GDXJ also, have not shot up as much as the other major market indices. In fact, GDXJ is even below its 10 year average. So if you wanna use past as an indicator, the gold producers are cheaper than they are over the last 10 years. Now, again, I want to reflect because of the determination of the companies in the GDXJ changed. So the, the truly junior companies that had no production made up a larger portion of the GDXJ 10 years ago. That has changed where larger producers, the mid tiers make up mainly the GDXJ, hence why that fact is true. But it's important to understand that it is in fact true. So when you hear the words frothy market, just look at the NASDAQ and how its price forward cash flow per share multiple is almost double its 10 year average, which are those orange, burnt orange bars. So you can look at the 10 year average for the NASDAQ is about 10.8 price to forward cash flow per share. And it's touching almost 21. The Dow Jones, 17.92 for current price to future cash flow per share. So you can see that the miners are nowhere near price appreciated for current price to forward cash flow per share as the NASDAQ or the Dow Joe or the Russell or the S&P 500. So all else being equal, if the price of either the GDX or GDXJ went up by 100%, they would still have lower price to forward cash flow per share multiples than the NASDAQ. It's an interesting fact to think about. The next chart is the gold price versus the Fed balance sheet. Okay, this is the one that most gold bugs always refer to why gold has to go higher. It's not the most correlated data set, especially since the Federal Reserve hasn't changed its gold holding since April 2006, but the growth in the Fed's balance sheet shows the extent of the massive stimulus packages. The chart you're looking at is the Fed balance sheet versus the gold price. Since unlimited QE drives down yields, the Fed's exploding balance sheet can be viewed as a key supporter of increasing gold prices, since gold becomes a more attractive safe haven investment when treasuries have historically low yields. Now, I've talked before about how gold is now no longer a negative carry that it was in the past, but you can look back to older videos on that. So while the Fed has continued to disappoint many investors by not committing to a policy of yield curve control and rejecting a negative interest rate policy, low rates should persist until at least the end of 2022 at the earliest. The Fed has staked its entire credibility on that timeline. As a gold investor, it's worth keeping an eye on central bank's balance sheets, as well as inflation expectations and real yields. The last chart you're gonna look at today is the paper gold ETF fund flows follow the money. It's been a record year for gold, and it's also a defining year for gold-backed ETFs like the Spider Gold Shares, the GLD, or the Sprott Physical Gold Trust. In a year of economic devastation, rampant speculation of financial markets, rock-bottom yields, and unprecedented changes to monetary policy, gold ETFs have been the vehicle of choice for major hedge funds and individual investors to de-risk and also benefit from surging gold prices. Within two months still left in the year, Gold ETFs across the world have already surpassed the previous annual record of gold ounces purchased, which was 
set in 2009 at 20.7 million ounces by over 45%. In fact, that record had already been surpassed midway through the year by June 30th. The additional 11 million ounces purchased since then has just been icing on the cake. The chart you're looking at right now is the annual gold ounces purchased by the ETFs. 2020, again, is a record year at 32.3 million ounces. In 2009 was the biggest year at 20.7 up to that point. But look at the outflow in 2013. Just remember that gold can be sold just as quickly as it can be bought. So based on all of the charts we've shown so far, all signs point to a bullish long-term outlook for gold and gold companies in the coming years. Of course, that doesn't preclude a reversal and consolidation of gold prices in the short term. If that does happen, there will be an incredible opportunity to build your portfolio for the upcoming gold bull cycle. In other words, you'll need to be informed and prepared so when the chance comes knocking, you'll be ready to put your money to work for you. Since the beginning of the year, the KRO, the Catoosa's Resource Opportunities Gold Portfolio, has delivered a little over 65% returns even after this most recent correction. While gold itself is only up 25%, and the S&P 500 is up 6.6% in the same time frame. Fortune may favor the bold, but right now our fortunes favor gold.